The COVID-19 pandemic has altered our lives in ways that most of us alive today never experienced before. With many under physical isolation and limited person-to-person contact, our basic need for human interaction has been limited to digital communication, brief separated encounters with masks and protective equipment, and the occasional exchange of a hand wave. Even our smiles and facial expressions are literally masked. How may we exchange affection and compassion at a time when traditional human touch is so limited? Joining me again this week on Destination Unlimited is my dear friend, Reverend Edie Weinstein. Edie is known by many names, including Love Ambassador, Optimistic, and Bliss Mistress. Edie delights in inviting people to live rich, full, juicy lives. She's an internationally recognized, sought-after, and colorfully creative journalist, interviewer, author, and editor, a dynamic and inspiring speaker, licensed social worker and interfaith minister, bliss coach, event producer, certified laughter yoga leader, certified cuddle party facilitator, and cosmic concierge. Edie is the founder of Hug Mobsters Armed with Love, which offers free hug events worldwide on a planned and spontaneous basis. She's the author of The Bliss Mistress Guide to Transforming the Ordinary into the Extraordinary and co-author of Embraced by the Divine, The Emerging Woman's Gateway to Power, Passion, and Purpose. Her website is Optimistical.com, and she joins me this week to share her path and how at this unprecedented time, even though we can't hug, we can still love. Please join me in welcoming to Destination Unlimited my friend, Edie Weinstein. Hi, Edie. Hi, thank you for having me back. It's been a while. But and thank it's you. Hear, it's lovely to hear your voice. And, and it's good to hear yours. And uh, we've been out of touch for a couple of years, but it's wonderful to have you back with us. We've been friends now for, I think, more than 20 years when we first met through the new seminary. Please share with our listeners meeting you for the first time, your path, and how it led to the wonderful work that you do. Thank you. Um, Yeah, it's actually 21 years now. Um, I found out about the new seminary through another graduate, Dr. Yvonne Kay. And my husband at the time, Michael, um, decided to enroll to become an interfaith minister. He enrolled in the two-year program. And because he had hepatitis C, he was ill a lot of the time and could only go to the correspondence classes. I think he may have gone to one in-person class up in New York. And I helped him to study, you know, casually studying along with him. I had no intention of becoming a minister, wasn't interested. We couldn't afford for both of us to go. But because he kept falling asleep while he was reading, I would read to him. He developed neuropathy in his hands and feet, so I would type his papers for him. I would listen to the tapes and watch the videos, and I was in on some of the group calls. And that was before the days of Zoom. It was all like a a conference call. And I was learning the material, little knowing why at the time, because God, spirit, whatever you want to call it, works in really mysterious ways sometimes. So Michael ended up in the hospital uh, five and a half weeks before he died. He went in on November 11th of 1998, and he died December 21st of 1998. And literally, when we disconnected life support, I heard the voice. And I imagine, isn't that what your your um, nickname is, the voice? Yes, the voice. Yes, it wasn't you, though. I don't think it was you. No, <laughs> I, I'm, not, I'm not that voice. <laughs> Okay, well, anyway, I called the voice, and the voice said, call the seminary and ask to finish what Michael started. And I knew exactly what that meant. So two days after his memorial service, which was Christmas Eve of 20, excuse me, of 1998, um, two days later, I called and spoke with Diane Burke, who was the dean at the time, and I told her what my plan was. She said, you're absolutely welcome to come to the seminary, take Michael's place in, in his class, and graduate this year when he would have graduated on two conditions. One is that you're doing it for yourself, too, and not just for him. And the other is that if you want to graduate this year, you need to do the first and second year's work simultaneously, or you can wait till next year. I said, Nat, we'll do it all at once, overachiever that I am. So I graduated with Michael's class that June, and it was at the Cathedral of St. John the Divine, this exquisite Gothic cathedral in um, in Manhattan. And... And it's that way ever since, you know, I graduated in 19, 1999. 
And since then, I've married somewhere between three and four hundred couples, and I've I've officiated at several. Um, I don't know how many, probably uh, maybe a hundred funerals, memorial services, and unfortunately, one of them a few weeks ago, which I can talk more about when we talk about the the impact of COVID um, on you know on the world. So that's how I became a you know a rev, just like you. Absolutely, and I had graduated in November of ninety seven. And uh, my partner and uh, the person that I went through the school with, uh, Judy, passed away January of 1998. Mm -hmm. And uh, after her passing, I became uh, active in uh, uh, the word dean doesn't really apply, but people used to call me a dean at the school. And I wasn't really a full-fledged dean, but I was participating in the classes. I would share my experience. I did a lot of the audio taping for the Uh, correspondence students and that's where you and I met and uh, became friends and uh, shared that same uh, experience of having lost you in your case your husband my in my case my partner Judy Mm -hmm. and uh, it started a wonderful friendship between us uh, Mm -hmm. commonality of understanding and uh, you went on your path and I went on my path but we've always connected through the years how has your experience as an interfaith minister changed your life only in every way imaginable. <laughs> um, uh, it helps me to stay grounded in love. Um, it helps me to be of, of additional service. One of the things I remember, I think it was Diane saying, um, was about being spontaneously available. And as a social worker, I do that anyway, but in a deeper way. It has me walking my talk. Um, I, you know, People will ask me a lot of spiritual questions and I say, I don't know. You know, it's, it's, I tell people that love is my religion and God's too big to put in a box. And it's about your relationship between your heart and the God of your understanding. And I believe in miracles. Um, one of the um, tenets of A Course in Miracles is that a, you know, a miracle isn't like lightning flashes and bells and whistles. It's um, seeing the world from a different perspective. And being an interfaith minister has helped me to do that. The other thing is that I rarely use the title reverend unless I'm signing a petition, <laughs> you know, like a, a piece of social justice oriented petition. It seems to carry more weight that way. Um, but I've loved officiating at services. Um, as I mentioned, I, I officiated at um, an in-person funeral about two weeks ago for a man who didn't die of COVID. He had a stroke. And when he was on hospice, his partner said, would you be willing to officiate at his funeral? It's going to be outside. There you know, will only be a few of us there and everybody will wear masks. So um, she was there. The man's son was there and then a few other family members. And it was a very blustery day. It was one of the last really cold days here in Pennsylvania. And uh, I, was, I, wore, I think I wore my winter coat for the first time, <laughs> like, a, like a formal winter coat for the first time in a while. And what was so deeply sad about the service is that I knew that when she went home, she'd be going home alone. And I told her, as much as I wish I could hug you, I can't. Um, because I am, you know, I am a hugger by nature and, and by semi-profession. And people that are losing loved ones now, whether through COVID or another um, another reason, are, are needing to grieve in different ways than they ever have before. So being a minister has helped me to be fully present with people in their grief, whatever that looks like. Absolutely. And we'll talk about that a little more later on in the interview. Um, You've interviewed many wonderful people in the human development and consciousness field. Who are some of your favorites and why? Okay. Well, the first one that comes to mind is Ram Dass, uh, who just passed last year. I interviewed him three times, and I called him Arienta because Michael and I met at a Ram Dass lecture in Philadelphia in 1986, I believe, 86. And so I've interviewed him. I interviewed him once before the stroke, twice after the stroke. And I got to meet him when he came to Philadelphia. I don't remember how many years ago it was. And we hugged. And he had more power in that one arm <laughs> that he could use to hug with. He was in a wheelchair. And, you know, that I've ever experienced um, up until then with, you know, with anybody I've interviewed. I interviewed Ben and Jerry. They were fun, uh, although we did it over the phone. So I had to keep asking them which one was speaking. Um, and that's how they, you know, how... Um, you know, I interviewed them, and I was disappointed they didn't send us any any samples of ice cream or anything fun, but they were fun. Uh, Shirley McLean, who else? Um, oh, Grover Washington Jr., 
a lot of really fun people. But the one that stood out the most um, was, of course, um, His Holiness the Dalai Lama. Um, that was in 2008. It was the interview of a lifetime that took me about 20 years to manifest. And when I said that Ram Dass um, hugged in a way that I'd never experienced before, well, when I inter- when I interviewed and, and met His Holiness, it was like that. It was that kind of energy um, that was more than just physical, um, you know, wrapping your arms around somebody. It was heart to heart hugging. And um, it was like a jolt of energy. Okay. Um, so that's, that's why. And that remain that will remain with me forever. And yeah. What a wonderful experience being heart to heart hugged with the Dalai Lama. Wow. Did that change your like, life in any way? Oh, and then you just like, yeah, no, nah, not at all. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> uh, it's sort of like the way that I ta- tell people about it is that when somebody you have a crush on in junior high school kisses you on the cheek and you say, oh, I'll never wash again. Yeah. Uh, it was sort of like that. I've washed a lot since then, <laughs> since, <laughs> since, since 2008. But yes, it's changed my life remarkably, partly because I got to meet him and be in his presence and partly because um, it's a dr- it was a dream of a lifetime that I was able to manifest, which I'll tell you about after the break. My wonderful guest, Edie Weinstein, we're talking about how we can express affection and compassion and love to one another at this time of physical isolation. We'll be back with more after these words on the Ohm Times Radio Network. Ohm Times Magazine is one of the leading online content providers of positivity, wellness, and personal empowerment a philanthropic organization. Their net proceeds are funneled to support worldwide charity initiatives via Humanity Healing International. Through their commitment to creating community and providing conscious content, they aspire to uplift humanity on a global scale. Ohm Times, co-creating a more conscious lifestyle. A social distancing tip. Putting distance between yourself and others is critical to slowing the spread of coronavirus. So here are ways to stay in contact without the physical contact part. Call, send a text, set up a video conference, post on social media, dedicate a song on the radio. If you have symptoms of fever, dry cough, and shortness of breath, call your health care provider before going to their office. For more info, visit coronavirus.gov. Let's all do our part, because we're all hashtag alone together. Brought to you by the Ad Council. Hello, I'm Lisa Berry. Join me every Monday at 1 p.m. Eastern Time for Light on Living, a chance to see new hear different, and feel more as I shine the spotlight on all the ways to lighten the load of life's challenges. Light on Living is your link to that new way you're looking for, that new understanding that will enhance your life, and that positive connection that will support your growth. So join me and you'll gain insight and start to see things in a new way that motivates you. During these times of worry, fear, and uncertainty, A calming and soothing voice may help you relax, clear your mind, and help you sleep. This is Victor the Voice Furman, and for the first time, I'm offering my voice for your well-being. I will craft a personal guided meditation to suit your needs. My fees are very reasonable, and I can provide your personalized guided meditation quickly. For more information, please send an email to voice at victorthevoice.com. That's voice at victorthevoice.com. Blessings, my friend. On Destination Unlimited, and my wonderful guest this week, my dear friend Edie Weinstein, we're talking about how we can express compassion and affection at this time of physical isolation. Edie, you're an expert on whole life makeovers following major life changes. Please share about this work, especially with those who came through significant medical crises. Okay. Um, when you think about a makeover, you think about external, you know, physical clothes, hair, makeup, uh, jewelry, you know, all of the, the trappings that we think um, make us attractive to the world. But a whole life makeover is going inside and saying, who do I want to become? What, what is it about me that um, I want to maintain? And what is it about me that I want to change? Um, some people that, that do makeovers for others from a fashion perspective 
will either encourage them to hold on to some of the pieces they already have and incorporate them into their new look or have them start from scratch. I think we need to carry with us whatever we were that led us to this point, not totally abandoning um, the parts of us that we, we cast into shadow. So a whole life makeover will be to say, all right, what is it in my life that's working? I want to do more of that. What, if, what is it in my life that ain't working at all? I want to do less of that because I don't know that we can totally obliterate our what we consider, consider and perceive as our, our um, challenges or weaknesses. And how can I combine those two? So um, people that have had significant medical crises, myself included, have had to do whole life makeovers. Uh, Mine is pretty simple. It took a long time to work through. Um, My mother, excuse me, my father died in 2008, same year as I interviewed the Dalai Lama. And I'm convinced that he had something to do with it because my father grew up in South Philly and knew everybody. So I think he pulled some strings too. Uh, But he died in 2008. My mom died in 2010. And I had to create a whole life makeover, just like I did when Michael died. And and I started my life again as a minister and um, single parent, widow, all of those those roles. And um, as somebody that tends to be a caregiver, I stuffed my feelings. I was um, the person that talked to the social workers at hospice that both of my parents were in. I was the minister who officiated at both of their services because I didn't want a rabbi that didn't know them officiating. So I did that. I was my mom's power of attorney and executor of her state. So while I was busy being social worker slash minister, the grieving daughter took a back seat. So 2013, November of 2013, um, three years after my mother died, that same weekend, which was Thanksgiving weekend, I developed shingles, and I had it on the whole left side of my face. So if you've ever had, if you've never had them, they're extremely painful, and I look like a Klingon from um, Star Trek on the left side of my face. And um, minister that I was, um, I had my first official same-sex Delaware wedding to officiate that weekend. And I said, I am not going to miss it. I don't care how much pain I'm in. And I called them and I said, um, have both of you had chicken pox? And they did because it's, it's connected to the chicken pox virus. So I drove from my area, Bucks County, Pennsylvania, down to Delaware with one eye closed because my eye was swollen shut. I put circular bandages on the lesions on my forehead. I officiated at the, the wedding ceremony, which is small, fortunately. It was in their, their living room, in their, their home. And then I drove back up, slept for like 18 hours. So that was step number one. I thought, okay, I got the message. I'm going to slow down. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, in June, coming up now on six years, June 12th of 2014, on my way home from the gym, uh, where I would work out five or six times a week, I had a heart attack at age 55. And I thought, okay, I have to slow down. I'll be okay. You know, I just need to take a, a few weeks off and I'll be, and I'll be fine. Now, at the time, I was working 12 to 14 hours a day at my job as a um, drug and alcohol counselor. And I was coming home and writing. I was going to the gym at 8 o'clock at night, which meant I was getting to bed till like midnight. Couldn't sleep. So I'd, I'd get maybe six hours sleep a night. Um, so that balance wasn't very good. And so I said, okay, I'll be fine. I'll be fine. And then a month later, uh, after I started a new job, I had ki- about my first round of kidney stones. And then after that, adrenal fatigue. Uh, two years ago, um, I had pneumonia and I was in the hospital for four days. And at every step, I kept saying, okay, I'm going to slow down. I'm going to slow down. I'm gonna... My body stopped, you know, stopped believing me. I lost credibility. So I had to totally revamp everything and hopefully i've you know i've done that what a a major turning point was the death of a dear friend um, who died coming up on two years in december my friend andrea uh, was a nurse and i was one of her caregivers at the end of her life and um, i saw how um, precious I, i mean i always knew life was precious but even more so because she was my age and she she did eventually die after I think a year and a half or two years of treatment. So I am not the person I was when I was married to Michael. I am not the person I was shortly after he died. I'm not the person I was when my parents died, um, when I had all those medical crises. And I'm recreating myself every day. So that's part of a whole life makeover is recreating yourself. You have you- the skill set for this. I had the skill set for this. What do you say to those who don't have the skill set for this? It's learnable. It's it's teachable, (laughs) you know, that we can develop coping skills, that we can all develop resilience, even if we didn't 
get taught that skill as a child, I encourage people to turn to their support systems, whether it's family, friends, clergy, um, sponsor in, in a 12-step program, um, good therapist, good you know, somebody, um, to know that you are not alone. And if you do have a spiritual faith, turn to the God of your understanding. And it is possible to learn those skills. Um, books, videos, uh, you know, all kinds of tools are out there. But I think that's the takeaway message is that you can learn anything if you are willing to, you know, to accept the support that it'll take to get you there. Absolutely. Now, you're one of the founders of the Hug Mobsters, along with our <laughs> mutual friend, Kim Skipper Corbin. Please tell us about this group and what they do. Well, Hug Mobsters Armed with Love is, is what we call ourselves. And Valentine's Day weekend, um, 2014, right, you know, months before the heart attack, I brought a group of friends to 30th Street Station, which is a big train station in Philly. And it was for a free hugs flash mob. And uh, there were a dozen of us there. And in an hour's time, I estimate we hugged about 200 people between us. One of them was a man who was an Iraq war vet who approached us and told us his story. He said he was the only survivor of his platoon and he had survivor's guilt. And could he join us? He said, I thought about ending my life until I met you people. And we went, whoa. And of course, we all cried. And we said, sure, we gave him a sign. And he was off to the races. And my immediate thought was hugs save lives. So a few months later is when I had the heart attack. And as part of my cardiac rehab, I walked around my little town of Doylestown, Pennsylvania. And I thought, why don't I combine the hugging with the walking? Because hugs are cardiac friendly and they're also emotionally heart friendly. And the, you know, the idea of the, the heart resonance, the heart math, I'm not real familiar with it, but I, has, I know that it has to do with kind of aligning energies with people. So since then, I've hugged in New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Delaware, Virginia, Maryland, Washington, D.C. Um, I've hugged in front of the White House. I hugged at the, um, the Vietnam War Memorial. I hugged in Canada. And then two years ago now, I was hugging my way across Ireland. And Kim and I have never actually met. She does her free hugs thing out in San Francisco, but we coordinated along with another friend named Tex Allen this um, event in October of 2016, and it was called Hugs Across America. And we decided, it was sort of like, do you remember the, the concept of Hands Across America where yes. people linked hands? Well, we figured that probably wasn't going to be practical because there were parts of the United States where there weren't people to hug each other, like, like big stretches of desert and mountains. So we said, well, why don't we just invite people all over the country to create their own hug event that day? So we did. I think there were like 21 cities, towns, whatever that did it. And Kim was part of it. And as I said, um, uh, Tex Allen, um, who was out there, he's in Mexico now, but he was out in that, that um, area as well. Um, so that's how, how we connected. But I miss doing that now. I can't. I mean, people are not are not open well, to hugs, well, and I wouldn't risk it right now. That's what we're saying. We're at a time when most of us, if we're not at home with members of our own family who are uh, not carrying the, the virus, we can't hug, but right. we can still love. What suggestions would you offer as to how, with physical distancing and isolation, we can still express our love? Well, the first thing I can tell you is I'm one of those people that doesn't have, I, I live alone. Um, I have wonderful, loving friends and family, and I stay in touch with people daily. Um, I have a, um, a new grandbaby who's now four months old, and that's the hardest part for me because up until um, this all hit, now it's 10 weeks, um, I was one of his caregivers, and now I haven't touched him in 10 weeks. So we FaceTime, um, we send videos to each other. I send him a video every morning where I sing to him or say a nursery rhyme. And when we visit, I, you know, when I go over there, we're at a distance. We sit far enough apart. And I encourage people to stay in touch with somebody, particularly if you're living in a city. Like I'm really fortunate that I live in a neighborhood where I can walk around and I can talk to my neighbors again from a distance. But if people are in a city where it feels higher risk and, and more scary to do that, I encourage them every day to reach out to somebody. If you're working from home, you're going to need to do that too. Um, I work from home, fortunately. I'm a therapist um, who does telehealth sessions. So um, 
what else? Talk to people, text them. Um, for better or for worse, um, social media is a helpful way to stay in touch with some people in your life. Share pictures of, of what you're eating, you know, or, or what you did today. Um, but just real. And, and the, oh, the other thing, too, it doesn't in, have to involve even physically talking to people. Once again, if you're somebody that prays or meditates or visualizes, imagine the people in your life. Imagine sending them love. Um, you and I are both Reiki masters, so we understand about sending energy. Do that if you can. Um, hold a vision of them in your mind and imagine holding them. Uh, imagine the last hug that you had with them. Imagine the next hug you're going to have with them. Um, so that helps. Um, if you can, volunteer in your neighborhood. If you feel safe to do that, like to, to deliver food or to help somebody with their yard work. Um, there are a lot of people that are out there for birthday parties going to, you know, to, to the home of the birthday person, honking the horn and, and um, holding up signs. Um, I've seen the same thing with um, graduations. Um, so just know that even though it feels like we're, we're, I hate the term social isolation, I call it physical separation. I agree. Um, that even though we're, we're not with each other, we're perhaps with each other in more conscious ways than we would have before. I will never, ever take any relationship for granted. Absolutely. And there are so many wonderful ways that we can express our compassion our love, and give hugs to others without that physical contact. My guest is Edie Weinstein. We're talking about what we will do during this period of the COVID pandemic in terms of expressing compassion and love and caring for one another. Edie, uh, let our listeners know how they can find out more about you. Sure. Okay. Um, my website is www.opti, O-P-T-I hyphen mystical, M-Y-S-T-I-C-A-L dot com. I'm also on Facebook, E-D-I-E-W-E-I-N-S-T-E-I-N. Those are the two primary reasons to know what I'm up to. And we'll be back with more of Edie after these words on the Olden Times Radio Network. This is OTR-FM, part of the IOM Radio Network. Humanity Healing International is a small nonprofit with a big dream. Since 2007, HHI has been working tirelessly to bring help to communities with little or no hope. Our projects are not broad mandates, nor are they overnight solutions, but they bring the reassurance that no one is alone and that someone cares. To learn more, please visit humanityhealing.org. Humanity Healing is where your heart is. Hello, I'm Sandy Sedgbeer, host of Om Times Magazine's flagship radio show, What is Going Om? My passion is sifting through information, research, and innovations from new thought teachers, speakers, and researchers, pushing back the boundaries of what we know about life, energy, metaphysics, and the universe. I love shifting perceptions about who we are, why we're here, and how quickly impossible becomes normal when we open our minds, expand our awareness, and accept that the only limits that exist are those we place upon ourselves. So if you're the kind of forward-thinking, eager investigator of what lies beyond the current reality that most perceive, why not make a date to come play with me in the field of possibilities at 4pm Pacific Time, 7pm Eastern Time every Thursday, and together we can discover what's really going on. Hi, this is Bill Maher. I can find humor in almost anything, but one thing I never laugh about is cruelty to animals. If you don't get the joke either, write People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals, 501 Front Street, Norfolk, Virginia, 23510. on Destination Unlimited. My guest this week, my dear friend Edie Weinstein, we're talking about what to do in terms of exchanging compassion and love during this time of the COVID-19 crisis and physical isolation. Since there is no playbook for a pandemic, how has life in the time of COVID changed for you? Wow. Um, well, first of all, as I mentioned, I live alone. So instead of getting out and going to work with people, I talk to people either over the phone or via uh, a telehealth platform. 
So my practice has changed. My, my therapeutic practice has changed. Uh, as a journalist, I'm used to writing from anywhere, so that really hasn't changed. But the content of my articles has changed considerably. I would say at least a dozen of them in the last two months have had a COVID flavor to them, some some kind of, of connection to the virus and the impact on people. Uh, I don't go out and hang out socially with people, so I'm staying home. I go to, you know, I go out to go to the supermarket, the pharmacy. Yesterday, I went to the gas station for the first time in three weeks because uh, my, you know, my tank was was on empty, and just in case I need gas in the, in the car. Uh, what else? I don't see my son and daughter-in-law as often um, as I did before. Normally, I'd be there two to three before all this, two to three times a week. And I'm exercising. My, my living room is now my, my gym as well. I've got the yoga mat. I've got the yoga blocks. I've got one of those big exercise balls, um, one of those stretchy exercise bands. So I put I keep them there so I don't forget. I can't, you know, since I don't go to the gym now, which is something I was doing now three to four times a week prior to this. So I get to work out every day, even a little bit, like in between clients. Um, I've lost about 40 pounds, not just because of that, but um, I have a, a hiatal hernia, which was pressing on my stomach, which made me feel pukey and not feeling like eating. So my body got used to eating less. So when I emerge from the cocoon, I'm going to look a little bit different. <laughs> no. mm -hmm. So there's that. Uh, what else? Um, I, I've always said prayers at night. I grew up in the Jewish tradition. So so in the Jewish tradition, Shema is the signature prayer. So I say that every night. But I also add that everybody in my life, everybody I know and love, everybody they know and love, and so on and so on, be safe. I also visualize a healing temple where I invite verbally, I'll say, okay, anybody wants to come in this temple and hang out there with me, they're welcome to do that. So it happens in my sleep. Um, I think that um, is a big, you know, big change for me too, is consciously saying, all right, I'm sending out healing. Um, you know, as a Reiki master, I don't even use the symbols anymore. I don't use the hands, nothing. I just, they just switch on. Um, so that feels good too. Uh, the other thing that's changed, I'm not prone to anxiety or depression, but every morning I wake up like, <gasps> like in a panic. And what I do is a, an inventory. I'll say, okay, you're safe and healthy. Everybody in your life is safe and healthy. I have one friend that was diagnosed and, and toughed it out at home for the past two months. And I saw him on a, a Zoom call this morning at one of the interfaith communities that we're part of. And he looked good, <laughs> which really surprised me uh, because he was not doing well at all. And he was only recently tested. He was, you know, he, he was struggling, but not sick enough to go, you know, to, to get tested. So he's the only one in my immediate circles, as far as I know. Let's keep it that way. Uh, but what I would say is, you know, everybody I know and love, everybody they know and love, I focus on everybody healing. So in the morning, I say, okay, I'm healthy and safe. My family is healthy and safe. I have a job, have a car, my computer works because I need that for work. Uh, I have lots of opportunities to continue to grow. Um, I have wonderful family and friends. Um, I'm, I'm blessed. Absolutely. Yep. Absolutely. So, As a therapist, what are you noticing in your practice in terms of the emotional response by your clients to the current state of affairs? Well, some of them are actually doing better in isolation because they may have social anxiety, uh, could be because uh, the world is a scary place for them, because they're used to being home, that this is, you know, for a lot of my clients, this is no different from what they normally do. They're used to working from home anyway. Um, some of them are challenged because not only are they working, but they've got to you know, help school their kids and they're going back and forth. I have some, I think at least two clients who are teachers. So while they're teaching their students, then they've got to shift gears and teach their own kids. Um, some of my clients were not doing well in their relationship and were contemplating leaving. And then they find out that they got to stay sequestered with this person that they wanted to separate from or divorce. So once I'm sure that they're safe, you know, everybody's safe there. Nobody's hurting anybody physically. Um, I tell them, you know, you guys got to figure out how to coexist in the meantime. Um, I've noticed that some families are closer. I've noticed that some couples are closer, that they're bonding in ways that they, they didn't have before. The ones that are struggling, um, you know, I say, okay, tell me what's, what's going on. What's your biggest fear? 
What are you most worried about? And usually it's somebody they love dying or them getting sick and dying. And I consider our sessions kind of like holy, you know, holy ground, that it's a sacred experience, that this is that for, for 45 minutes, once a week, once every two weeks, I bring a safe haven to them. So that's, that's changed. And I encourage them, use all the coping skills you had before this, and let's add some more to the toolkit. You came up with an expression that you shared with me, quarantine brain. What is quarantine brain? Right. Now, I don't know that I created that one, but the idea is that in quarantine, when people uh, don't have the freedoms to come and go, when their routine might seem um, boringly similar day to day, uh, our executive functioning goes offline. So our decision making, our concentration. So if somebody's already prone to ADD or ADHD, they may be more scattered. Um, they may feel like they, they start to do something and then lose interest in it. And, um, you know, it, I, I believe that it's healable. I don't think we're going to be this way forever, that people are going to be that way forever. But, um, it, because of the circumstances that we find ourselves in, there may be people that have experienced post-traumatic, that will experience post-traumatic stress disorder because this is a trauma. You know, being told that you can't come and go for your own safety, um, knowing that people could, you know, have died from this contributes to the condition. Um, watching too much TV. Um, I don't watch what I call the stress conferences because they're, they're really not helpful <laughs> for me. Um, they're, um, you know, so I encourage people to take a news fast and get their, uh, their information from sources that they trust. And, um, yeah, it's, it's about reclaiming your, your mind, too. There's a concept in psychology called generational trauma. This is unprecedented for anyone in our peer group and, and, and possibly uh, our parents, but younger. Uh, th can this lead to generational trauma? Oh, I believe that. The one thing I would correct is that there is generational trauma that's affecting us now. I have friends who are, whose parents were Holocaust survivors. Yes, yes, um, absolutely. So that, that generational trauma carried on to them. But, um, yeah, for, for those of us, unless we were, we or our family members were in concentration camps, internment camps, if they were Japanese American, um, you know, any, any place where people were held prisoner by a government source. For most of us, this is unheard of. So yes, I do think that it will have an impact. Um, I have a grandson, and fortunately, at four months old, he has no clue what's going on. All he knows is that mommy and daddy love him, and that they're taking care of him, and that his his grandparents, he gets to see our faces on the screen. <laughs> that's about Absolutely. it. So I think that's going to have an impact, too, that for, for people whose um, only contact with their grandparents or their grandchild are through a video screen, they're going to be really surprised when they see them in person. <laughs> You've had, personally, some intense dreams in the past few months. Can you share some? Absolutely. I'm going to um, read you one that I wrote in my article about quarantine brain. I dreamed I was working at a psychiatric hospital, not the one where I had worked for 12 years, that had mountains and streams on one side and an ocean on the other. I had just started the job and could not remember how to get to the unit and knew I was supposed to meet with a patient at a particular time. I kept asking for directions and was sent all different meandering ways. Getting more confused, I ended up crossing over an icy stream, falling in and feeling as if I was sinking into it. The man who was guiding me helped me out and we continued on. I then ended up on the other side where the ocean was and walked on the beach to get into the building, which seemed more like a hotel than a hospital. I don't think I ever found the right place. Uh, I was then walking to my car and could not recall where I parked it. I reached for my purse and couldn't find it either. It had my wallet, keys, and phone in it. I wondered how I would get into my car without my keys. Then I woke up. I know that much of it had to do with my forgetfulness and feeling lost since this worldwide chaos began. And I also know that water is about emotional flow. That was one. Um, in the very beginning, um, back 10 weeks ago, I had a dream about China. I've never been to China, never had any interest in going. And in the dream, everybody was celebrating. And there was this one man speaking Mandarin, which I don't speak. And it seemed like it was a real positive thing. Um, I had a dream where my mother, who died, as I mentioned, in 2010, was driving my car. And I looked over to the right and I saw this tornado spinning in the sky. And it's, what's funny is that I know you can't see me, but I'm doing the tornado spinning thing with my hand. Um, there was a tornado spinning. And I said, Mom, you got to drive to my house really quickly because it's going to hit us. We drove home. 
and my house has a skylight in my hallway and I said quick we've got to get into the bathtub because the bathroom is the innermost room in my house but as I looked up at the skylight the tornado was right over us and I took a deep breath and I blew it away um, so the dreams that I have that have connection to this and I'm convinced that all of them do I always wake up feeling empowered I always wake up feeling like, okay, there's a solution. There's a happy, you know, happy ending to this. I had one dream where we were able to hug again, but only either back to back um, or front to back, like you're spooning somebody that we weren't able to do full frontal hugs yet. Um, but I look forward to dreams because I say, okay, give me some answers here. I want to know what to do. You know, give me my, mar- my marching orders. In the tornado dream, was Toto or the red slippers present? No, uh-uh, uh-uh. And I, I mean I could hear the you know the dun 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 you know that kind of sound, but no, they weren't there. Surrender, Dorothy. Oh, that's funny. My guest, Edie Weinstein, we're talking about what to do at this time of physical separation, physical isolation. We'll talk more about that after these words on the Ohm Times Radio Network. Ascending Hearts is no ordinary dating site, but a spiritual dating site with a purpose, to link you with your soulmate. We engineer the serendipity so you can trust that you will attune with someone that has the same matching vibration as you. Ascending Hearts, the conscious dating site for the spiritually aware. Try Ascending Hearts for free, ascendinghearts.com. The student asks the teacher, How do I experience transformation? The teacher replies, when the student is ready to receive deeper answers, the student then asks, how do I know what deeper questions to ask? And the teacher replies, when the student decides to commit to a practice inviting transformation, level two questions will be revealed. Hi, I'm Tomas Garza. And as a teacher and host, I'm inviting listeners to enroll in the mastery of transformation by joining me on Decide to Transform, your bridge to level two answers. Tuesdays, 1 p.m. Eastern on Ohm Times Radio. A social distancing tip. Keeping your distance from others is important in slowing the spread of coronavirus. So here are some fun things to do alone. Read a book, take a walk, unpack your suitcase from that trip you took last September, paint a self-portrait, catch up on a TV series, do a puzzle. Remember, we should all stay home to lower the risk for everyone. For more info, visit coronavirus.gov. Let's all do our part, because we're all hashtag alone together. Brought to you by the Ad Council. Hey, hon, what you doing with your fun? Do flowers have best friends? I don't know. Hey, look. Whoa. Some answers can only be found in nature. Discover the unsearchable. Visit discovertheforest.org to find a trail near you. Brought to you by the United States Forest Service and the Ad Council. So I'm a cat, and I just moved in with this new human, And she's got this little toy she's always playing with, all day long. Tap, 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 bloop, bloop. She can't put it down. There it is. Oh, and get this. She even talks to it. Last week, she asked it for Chinese. And guess what? Egg rolls showed up. Like magic. Humans have cool toys. A person is the best thing to happen to a shelter pet. Be that person. Adopt. Brought to you by the Ad Council and the (laughs) ShelterPetProject.org. Back on Destination with my wonderful dear friend, Edie Weinstein. We're talking about how we can express affection, compassion, and love at this time of the COVID-19 pandemic. Edie, is self-quarantining an act of love or an act of fear? Well, I prefer to think of it as an act of love. Um, Sometimes it does lop over into fear. I've gotten so comfortable in my home that I'm even reluctant to go out to go to the store. But I look at it um, as a way of, you know, staying home to take care of, of myself, obviously, because as I mentioned, I'm in the high risk group with, the, you know, all the health conditions and my age, 61. <clears throat> but I'm also doing it just like wearing a mask um, to protect other people. So I see it as an act of love, partly because I have friends who are in the medical profession. So the idea of flattening the curve, which was the, the intention in the beginning, is ha- has happened in most places so it's a way of loving my you know my community members it's a way of loving the people that are in the medical profession that are taking care of everybody so yeah i think of it as an act of love when this first started 
and the people in government started talking about separation. They used the term social distancing, which I personally didn't like. What are your thoughts about the concept of physical distancing, which is what really this is, versus social distancing? Yeah, I, I cringed the first time I heard it, too, because we're not socially distant. We're social creatures. We need each other. And if anything, we're more socially connected than we were before this. Um, so the physical distance, the you know, not being in close enough proximity to anybody that you're not living with is a way of preventing spreading the infection. Um, the, an analogy that I first heard when somebody was asking me, how do you explain it to little kids? I said, imagine that you put your hands in a bunch of glitter and you get it all over your hands. And then you touch a doorknob and it's got glitter all over it. And then you wash your hands and the glitter's off your hands, but it's on the doorknob. And somebody touches the doorknob, which got the glitter on it, and they carry it to the next person. So I didn't make that up. I forget where I read that. But it made perfect sense to me that if we don't want to spread the virus, since it seems to be spread primarily through, you know, breathing, coughing, sneezing, you know, aerosolizing the term they use with the, you know, the the drops of of virus, um, we need to be far enough away from each other not to do that. And the irony is that a time when we most need each other, like if people were, were sick and dying from another condition that wasn't contagious, like if somebody has cancer, it's not contagious, they're going to want potentially want and need your physical support and you can give it to them but now when people are sick and perhaps dying from this we can't give them our physical support for those who are accustomed to being with others and who find themselves alone how would you address the absence of nurturing touch from others and is there a way that we can give ourselves nurturing touch oh yeah absolutely um Well, one of the things that I did before this was a workshop called Cuddle Party, which had to do with communication, boundary setting, and safe nurturing platonic touch by consent. And now that we can't do this physically, um, I'm I'm going to be starting to do them online, uh, the equivalent of, and I was just on one right before I talked to you, where another facilitator in California um, was was offering it. And he walked us through self-massage, he walked us through self-hugs. And since I've been sequestered, um, I've been doing self-massage. I've been, because I'm a massage practitioner also, uh, I've been sleeping with teddy bears, which it never even occurred to me to do in the beginning, Um, fuzzy blankets, um, a heating pad. uh, What else? So you can do scalp massage. When you're washing your hands, don't just make it a duty. Make it a, um, a ritual. So you got the lather, your fo- open up your hands and just do a little hand massage. So that'll last longer than 20 seconds. Um, same thing when you're in the shower, you know, when you're washing yourself, don't just do, you know, quick in, quick out. Um, really take the time to take care of your body um, so that, you know, those are things that help as well. And if you have animals at home, hug them. If you are with other people, I tell people that I know that live with folks that, you know, if, they'll, if they allow them to hug them, hug extra for those of us that can't. Absolutely. And the act of uh, nurturing oneself and giving oneself compassionate and loving touch is really something that'll go a long way toward developing self-love for those who don't have that. And when we come out of this, when, you know, when we're finally able to hug other people, uh, I think we're going to see a different perspective on touch. You know, the people are not going to be as as touch averse because I believe we have skin hunger that's just as important to meet as food hunger. And that's where a lot of depression is coming in for people. Um, A number of years ago, I I went to a homeless shelter in Kensington, which is a neighborhood in Philadelphia. And um, it was a, a veterans, homeless veterans shelter. And there was a man there that said, nobody has touched me in 20 years. I've not had a hug in 20 years. Oh, my. Of course, I hugged him extra. (laughs) No. So it's it's a challenge for the you know the str- you've heard the struggle is real. It's a challenge for those of us that don't have people in our lives that we can touch right now. Now you touched upon the concept of consent when you have these cuddle parties and the like. There are so many who were touch adverse and adverse to physical contact before the crisis started, uh, often stemming from childhood trauma abuse. How can we approach them when this is over? Well, first of all, the same way that we did before with um, request, you know, not demand, not insistence, um, ask them what they need, what they want. Like when I do the free hugs thing, I'll say, may I hug you or would you like a hug? And if somebody says yes, then we hug and I let them be the first one to break off contact. So I'll hug as long as they want to. And for people that say no, I'll say thank you for taking care of yourself. 
Usually what they'll say is, nah, I'm good. And I said, I know you're good, but hug somebody. So they'll, they'll, maybe they're with somebody there, they'll hug them, um, or they'll hug their dog if the dog is there. But the rules haven't changed. Um, I still would ask, and I would still go at their comfort level. I think we're going to come up with a new term when this is over. There are people who are hungry. I think there'll be people who are huggery. Huggery, yeah, I like that. You like that, huggery? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. How could we help ameliorate the mental health impact of this virus? Well, as I mentioned earlier, um, reach out. Um, if you know somebody who lives alone or is, is predisposed to mental health issues, reach out to them. Don't wait for them to come to you. Check up on your family members and your friends. Check up on somebody every day. Uh, if you have an elderly person in your life that lives alone or that's ill, call them. You can do um, you know, through the window visits, through the front door visits. Um, send them cards. If there are people that are tech savvy, text them. Um, do FaceTime with them. Um, encourage and encourage people. If you don't have a good therapist, find one. Um, if you have health insurance, check with your insurance company and see who's in network. Um, if you're in a position where you can't afford therapy, check with a local mental um, community mental health center. Um, they may be able to do a sliding scale. Um, so re reach out for support. If you are dealing with an addiction, don't use your substance of choice as a way of self-medicating. Uh, I was astounded. Um, I watched this TV show called Mom. I don't know if you've ever seen it, but it's a comedy that's about multi-generational addiction. And the network that had it on had commercials for online gambling. And I thought, oh, my goodness, you know, that's, first of all, an oxymoron considering what the show is about. But I said, people, you know, can't, if they can't go to the racetrack, they can't bet on sports, they can still gamble at home, which I think is feeding their addiction. Um, so I encourage people, if you have an active addiction or if you are in recovery and you're teetering, go to a 12-step meeting. They're all online. The other thing is um, suicidality. There's been a major uptick in suicides, um, partly as a result of the quarantine, because people are alone, they're desperate, they're hopeless. Um, there is a suicide hotline, 800-273-TALK, T-A-L-K. And if you go online, you'll see this little green card with the word suicide prevention and a little phone on it. And it's a 24-7 hotline. So people can call there. Um, that's something I would suggest doing. The other thing is that there's an increase in domestic violence because people are um, sequestered at home. Most communities have some kind of domestic violence program. The National Domestic Violence Hotline is 800-799-SAFE-7233. So if you are in danger, call. People are um, at their wit's end. <laughs> to, uh, to absolutely. Them. Absolutely. Who will you be on the other side of this? Oh, uh, when you ask that question, I get goosebumps, and that's my truth barometer. Frankly, I don't know. Uh, what I hope I will be is somebody who's more compassionate, more understanding, because having been a therapist for 40 years and working with people with depression and anxiety, I had I never really experienced it, and now I have that morning, <gasps> you know, morning panic that I wake up with. So it will give me greater compassion for people that, that are challenged with it every day. I'll be somebody that takes nothing for granted. And um, to know that life turns on a dime. Uh, I knew all this anyway, but I've never experienced anything quite like this. I'll also know that I'm more resilient, that I'll be able to live a fuller life than I ever did before. To know that I'm, you know, I'm capable of so much more than I thought I was. Absolutely. I think that's something that each of us can uh, address and, and look at and say, yeah, that's about right for me. And the other thing, I think there's a greater thing. I think that in our society, we've been spoiled and we know that we've been spoiled. And I think we've taken a lot of things that we do on a daily basis for granted, the freedoms that we have, the economy that we've had, the plentifulness in, in most areas. And there are areas that have lack of food and lack of, of resources. But generally speaking, I think most most of us have taken what we have here for granted, and I think we'll never do that again. Oh, absolutely not. Yeah, and to know that we are, you know, we're, we're all capable, resilient people. Given the opportunity to share one message with the world right now, what would it be? <sighs> oh, my. To know that no matter what it looks like, that you are loved, that you are safe, that I know this may sound like airy-fairy cosmic foo-foo stuff, but it's gotten me through a lot, is that I've survived everything that's ever happened in my life, and so have you. And to know that you either have what it takes to get through it or 
Other people can can help bolster you in the meantime to appreciate the beauty of every day, um, to realize that everybody in our lives is on loan to us, and to take care of Mother Nature. We had talked about this before the call, that um, nature is is coming back to life. You know, the air is cleaner, the water is cleaner, animals are coming out from hiding. And the sad part is, as human as a human species, we have well, I don't think we've learned our lesson. I think there are people that will go right back to the same behaviors. The corporations will, will go back. You know, the skies are, as you mentioned, um, you know, living in a flight path of an airport. Uh, you're not here in as many airplanes, and I bet the sky is clear, clearer. Absolutely. So, to know that we, you know, that we are all in this together. Maybe that's a takeaway message too. We're all in this together, and we need each other. We don't have the luxury of um, being at odds with each other. And regardless of what side of the political aisle you're on, um, be kind, be caring. Think about the next generation. Think about what you can do to make a difference. And it's not all about I, me, mine. It's about um, we and us. And as every major faith in the world has as the basic foundation, love one another, do unto others as you would have them do unto you, love thy neighbor as thyself. And let's add to that, love your world because it's the only one we have. Yep, absolutely. My guest, my dear friend, Edie Weinstein. Edie, please tell our listeners one more time (laughs) where they can find out about you and all of this work. Thank you. Um, my website again is optimistical, O P T I hyphen M Y S T I C A L dot com. And then my Facebook page, E D I E W E I N S T E I N. Edie, thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure. And great big hugs. And big hugs back to you. And thank you all for joining us on Destination Unlimited. I'm Victor, the voice Furman. Have a wonderful week. 